welcome everyone to the call. Um, I, as I mentioned in my email, I've had a few questions recently um, about the uh, specific wrinkles of, of copyleft licenses. And certainly copyleft licensing is um, sort of the, you know, where the rubber meets the road uh, when it comes to open source license compliance, because copyleft licenses are, you know, have by far the most, uh, you could say restrictive terms, but you know the most compliance requirements attached to them, and so you know it's it's relatively easy, I guess, for a company to get its open source compliance house in order when it comes to permissive licenses, where the only obligations are providing a copy of the license and um, you know a warranty disclaimer uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but when it comes to copyleft licenses, you have to start understanding how those licenses um, work when you're making combinations of the copyleft software with proprietary software or with other open source software under licenses that may have a different set of restrictions attached to them. Um, and so, uh, you know, given the questions that I've been getting privately and that we've seen at some of the recent uh, presentations, I wanted to take the opportunity to do a deep dive on uh, the ins and outs of some of the more prominent copyleft licenses, specifically uh, the GPL variants. Um, so I'll go ahead and share my screen. I've got a presentation. Uh, as usual, um, if folks have questions, um, feel free to interrupt me at any time. You're welcome to do so uh, using the chat or just unmute yourself and talk to us. Um, happy to keep it fairly informal that way. It looks like we don't have a giant group today, so I don't think uh, interruptions will be unwelcome. And I'm sure if you have a question that others on the call will have a question as well. So please feel free to chime in. Um, <clears throat> okay, so Starting out with the basics, what is a copyleft license? Uh, so this is my own definition here. A uh, copyleft license is an open source license requiring that if you distribute a derivative work of the software, you must provide the corresponding source code for the derivative work to the recipient under the terms of the same license. Now this is, uh, this is narrower than the complete definition. So there are copyleft licenses that require you to provide source code even if you're distributing the stock version. So the GPL, for example, if you're distributing an unmodified Linux kernel uh, to third parties, you're still required to provide or offer the corresponding source code to that. So derivatives works, derivative works are where this becomes, um, you know, of greatest moment to companies, but it's not the only place where this applies. And this definition is also a little bit narrow in the sense that it doesn't include the AGPL, um, the Afero GPL, which requires you to provide a corresponding source code for a derivative works if you're providing access to the software over a network. Um, but for the most part, this definition uh, applies to, to most cases you're going to come across. Uh, so there are effectively two categories of uh, copyleft licenses, uh, strong copyleft uh, in including the GPL and the AGPL, or weak or library copyleft licenses, which include uh, the LGPL, the Mozilla public license, uh, the Eclipse public license, arguably, um, and the Sun uh, CDDL, um, which was common among you know, Sun open source software back in the 90s, um, but is still used on some stuff today. Um, so this, this distinction or this categorization can be a little bit misleading insofar as the different uh, quote weak copyleft licenses have uh, fairly distinct terms from one another. So uh, don't assume from this categorization that you can lump the weak copyleft licenses together because they have different requirements. Um, but generally speaking, a strong copyleft license requires you to provide the source code for uh, the complete derivative work. So if you combine uh, GPL software with proprietary software, you're required to make the whole thing under uh, the terms of the GPL. 
and provide source code for the entire combined work. Whereas a weak copyleft license generally only requires you to provide source code for uh, the for the copylefted work and any modifications you make to that. But if you have if you've combined it, for example, by linking it with a proprietary work, then you're not required to uh, provide source code for or uh, apply the license to your own code. So as I said, there are a few different um, uh, weak copy left licenses. Uh, this is not a comprehensive list. Um, for better or worse, uh, there is a, a jungle out there when it comes to variations on different open source licenses. Um, but these are by far the most prevalent we copy left licenses. Uh, the LGPL is the most prevalent and also uh, I would I would say the strongest copy left of all the we copy left licenses. So it's it's similar to the GPL, um, but it permits you to link a proprietary work with an LGPL work uh, so long as um, you provide source code for the LGPL work and any modifications. And as long as you are uh, linking it to the proprietary work um, in, you know, in sort of the, the standard or expected way. Um, so there is specific language in the LP LGPL designed to prevent you from sort of trying to circumvent the copyleft by, um, you know, making modifications that would cause your software to interface with the LGPL software. Um, sort of beyond the intended scope of its interface. Um, the LGPL, I think, refers to this as, as, or at least the FSF and their FAQ about this refers to it as sort of more intimate interfaces between the software. Um, but so long as you're, you know, using the sort of standard interface um, and you provide um, recipients of the software the ability to make modifications to the LGPL software and then recombine it with uh, whatever software you've combined it with so that they're using a modified version of the LGPL uh, library, then you're not required to apply the license to your proprietary software or to provide source code for your proprietary software. Um, but you know that's, a, that's an important element of the LGPL that's commonly overlooked. This, um, you know, the, the LGPL, which comes from the Free Software Foundation, who are who are concerned primarily with permitting users of open source software the the freedom to make modifications to code and and run the modified code for themselves. Um, you know, this is a this is a distinction of the LGPL uh, uh, from other weak copyleft licenses, in that you have to permit users or give users the practical ability to modify the library and then recombine it with with your proprietary code so you can do that by using um, uh, like shared library functions or you can do it by providing you know whatever you need to um, to to make that recombination possible the mpl uh, can be described as more of a file level copy left um, it really only applies to modifications that you make to the source code of the open source component. So it doesn't, uh, unlike the GPL and LGPL, it doesn't, um, it doesn't reference the concept of derivative works under copyright law. Um, it just says basically if you modify the source code, um, then you're required to provide mod your modifications uh, to the source code. Um, along with along with the library, um, and and the copyleft again only extends to the library itself and those modifications. And then uh, Justin Colonino mentioned the Eclipse license um, and its sort of unusual features in uh, in his presentation at our last meeting. The Eclipse public license, as he mentioned, is commonly interpreted to be a weak copyleft license, um, but you know, in, in fact, if you read the text of the license, um, it, it doesn't seem too different in scope from the GPL on its face. Um, it basically says, um, you know, the you're not required to provide source code for um, a separate software module, I think are the are the terms it uses. Um, 
so long as that separate module is not a derivative work of the Eclipse license software. Um, but, you know, derivative work is merely a, a term from copyright law. And, you know, the scope of derivative works is, you know, what causes people to sort of grind their teeth over interpreting the GPL. So, you know, the community interpretation of the Eclipse license and how it's historically been enforced uh, is that it is a, a weak copyleft license with a similar scope to the Mozilla public license. But if you, if you get down into the text, um, you might be less comfortable with that interpretation. So I guess, you know, this sort of takeaway from that is it's a good idea when, you know, when evaluating uh, Eclipse license software to see what the sort of interpretation or, or usage within the specific community that produced the software is, um, because, you know, that that's going to tell you um, more accurately sort of what your risk profile is with that software. So what is a derivative work? So this is this is important because particularly in the world of the uh, the GPL, um, the, the copyleft is going to apply to any derivative work of the GPL software. Uh, derivative works are, uh, or the term derivative work is a creature of uh, the United States Copyright Act. Um, so it is defined by the statute and by by case law. Um, and, you know, if you ask the Free Software Foundation that, write, that wrote the GPL, what, uh, what is the scope of derivative works or what, what is considered a derivative work in the context of the GPL, they will just point you to copyright law and say the scope of derivative works is as broad as it is under copyright law, which leaves uh, a fair bit of uncertainty um, in determining, you know, what specific combinations might be considered derivative mm. works. But this is the definition from the Copyright Act. A derivative work is a work based upon one or more pre-existing works. And here we get into, uh, you know, the, the broad scope of copyright. And a lot of this does not apply to software, but such as a translation, a musical arrangement, a dramatization, a fictionalization, a motion picture version, sound recording, art reproduction, abridgment, condensation, or any other form in which a work may be recast, transformed, or adapted. A work consisting of editorial revisions, annotations, elaborations, and other mo modifications, which as a whole represent an original work of authorship, is a derivative work. So what is a derivative work of software? Um, so there are, there are a few uh, places where the courts have, have ruled that something is specifically a derivative work. And so um, you know, of course, the, the legal landscape in the United States, um, federal courts, also all of these are federal courts decisions. Um, and in federal courts, the, the opinion of one federal court uh, is not necessarily binding on uh, other federal courts, uh, unless, unless you're talking about an appellate court. Um, and, and, you know, then the opinion is a binding on the appellate courts or the appellate and district courts under that court. So I don't wanna represent that these conclusions are necessarily applicable across the entire US federal legal landscape even, but they give you a sense of where courts have come down on the question of derivative works and software. Um, and we'll talk about a few more cases later, um, but um, there is one case uh, in 2013 um, that involved, you know, literally making modifications, bug fixes, et cetera, to proprietary source code belonging to another company. So this was a case where basically one company was offering services to uh, maintain the software provided by another company to its customers. So they would go on site with the customer and make modifications to the software. And um, the court, I think correctly uh, held that when they did that, they were making a derivative work of the proprietary software. So modifying literal source code is clearly producing a derivative work. Uh, there's another case where a company translated another company's proprietary software into uh, a different architecture. So I think it was from like PC to VAX. Um, I think <laughs> obviously an older case. Um, 
but you know, again, translation is something that's specifically included in the definition of derivative works um, in the Copyright Act. So that was an easy call for the court um, that that creates a derivative work. Uh, then there was a more recent case. I don't know if you all have heard of the company Psystar. Um, they made some waves uh, several years ago when they you know, announced that they were going to start um, producing uh, or selling uh, computers built from commodity computing hardware, but that ran uh, Max OS X. Um, and they did that basically by, um, you know, buying, you know, buying individual licenses to OS X, stripping out the bootloader and um, uh, kernel modules that that supported Apple's hardware and then loading some of their own kernel modules to support the hardware that they were using. Um, and the uh, uh, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that that was a, uh, a derivative work of OS X. Um, but the big question in the world of open source is, um, you know, when do you produce uh, a derivative work by using open source libraries and a proprietary product? So this is just sort of a hypothetical um, a custom application A, where it's using three different open source libraries, one licensed under the GPL v2, one under LGPL v2, and uh, one under the Apache license version two. And the question is, is A a derivative work of those three uh, libraries and what, what are the consequences if it is? Uh, so courts have not answered this question specifically in the open source context. Um, there, there are certainly are some cases out there in the world involving open source software, but what constitutes a derivative work of open source um, has not been really squarely answered by courts. And so, you know, we sort of just have to turn to our understanding of copyright law and other cases involving software and non-software works to answer this question. So there are various answers that um, you can find out there um, from lawyers who are experienced in open source, uh, lawyers who aren't experienced in open source and others in the community. Um, so, you know, one interpretation is if A isn't going to work or run without, you know, L1, L2 and L3, then it's a derivative work, uh, no matter how it's combined with that software. Uh, another, another interpretation is that um, A is a derivative work if and only if it contains uh, literal code from those libraries. So if you've if you've incorporated a library source code and all into um, into your application, then it's a derivative work. But if it contains no literal copying, then it's not. Um, and again, this is this is I'm not saying that this is the right answer. This is just an answer that's out there. Um, and then there is a sort of additional wrinkle on this. Uh, a lot of the analysis gets down into the details of linking um, in the context of C and C++ applications. Um, and there's sort of this question of whether statically linking um, a program versus dynamically linking a program um, with a library uh, produces a derivative work. Um, so if you, when you statically link a C library uh, into an application, then the library um, is compiled into object code and the object code is is combined into a single executable file with the program. So, you know, in the end, you end up with a, a single executable file that contains code from the library and from the program. So, you know, there's sort of general agreement that statically linking uh, a library con uh, creates a derivative work of it. There's less agreement on whether dynamically linking a library does. Um, so dynamically linking a library in, in, in the world of C code, um, we'll copy uh, basically the function headers uh, into, uh, into the compiled executable, but then with just pointers to the locations of the, those functions in, in memory. Um, so the library won't itself be incorporated into, into the program uh, wholesale. So there has been some dispute as to whether um, as to whether, you know, dynamic linking is, you know, ha is legally any different from static linking. 
um, even though ultimately the functionality of the program is going to be identical, um, whether the sort of, uh, you know, the procedural details of how they get combined uh, makes a difference legally. And then there's a, an opinion out there that um, when you combine libraries with an application in this way, you have formed what's called a collective work under copyright rather than a derivative work. So a classic example of a collective work is like a, an encyclopedia volume where you have uh, several independent articles on different topics um, that are combined into you know, volume A of the encyclopedia. Um, and there are separate copyrights on each of those individual articles. Um, and then there is a copyright on the compilation itself. Um, and so there are there are those that that um, that consider this kind of combination to form a, a collective work, and and who believe that because the GPL focuses on derivative works, um, that the GPL would not apply um, would not require that combination to be um, licensed under the under the. Uh, GPL itself. I, I will point out that this is very much not the view of the Free Software Foundation uh, who authored the GPL, and I, I would consider it an, a minority interpretation among those who, who practice open source law. <clears throat> so um, my, my view is that the safe bet is um, that it's best to avoid getting cute with um, with you know your interpretation of of um, derivative works uh, when it comes to open source software, so I, I think there is a tendency um, among those who you know work in the world of commercial software and you know use open source heavily to think that you know that open source is somehow categorically different from proprietary software, but in the end. Um, courts um, have rejected uh, the sort of interpretations that would allow you to skirt copyleft um, when when the parties uh, or when the when the software involved was all proprietary software. Um, and so I'll give you a few examples uh, to sort of illustrate what I mean. So this case uh, is one that Justin covered last week, MicroStar v. FormGen. This is the Duke Nukem 3D case where um, MicroStar was, was basically uh, compiling a bunch of uh, user-created uh, level or map files for the game, Duke Nukem 3D, and selling them on a, on a CD-ROM as sort of like a new set of levels for the game. And uh, they were sued by FormGen for copyright infringement. And they made the argument that you know we didn't do any literal copying of any any copyrighted um, work in the Duke Nukem game. Uh, we didn't copy any image files. We didn't copy any code. Uh, we didn't copy any videos, etc. All we did is provide these data files that instruct the game to you know place a place a monster here, place a gun here, place a wall here, etc. Um, and you know the the files only work with a game that's been appropriately purchased and licensed by, by the user. Um, and so there's no copyright infringement. The court rejected that. Um, now, the way that they rejected it is like the court's actual reasoning is a little bit silly. Um, they basically said that they were infringing uh, FormGen's right to create sequels of their own game because map files basically consisted of sequels to the story of the game. Um, now, I, th that may be the right result. I think it's kind of goofy reasoning, but this case sort of illustrates that when courts sort of smell something amiss, they're going to find a way to protect the rights of the copyright holder, even if they have to stretch it a bit to get there. So, you know, I think this this illustrates that, you know, the the argument that uh, so long as you didn't do any literal copying of an open source library when you made a combination with with your proprietary software, uh, it's not infringement is not necessarily as as strong as it might seem. 
Um, so here's another case that, that kind of offers uh, a comparable analysis to the, um, the sort of dynamic linking uh, argument. Um, so this, this case is a little hard to interpret because it's clear that the, the judge didn't know, uh, didn't understand too much about the technical details um, of what was going on. And there's definitely a lot of bad facts in this case other than what I present here. Um, that that um, sort of made it inevitable that the court was going to side with the plaintiff. Um, but uh, this was a company who, so uh, a company that had been acquired by Dun & Bradstreet provided software for um, managing HR and payroll, et cetera, um, including a program that, that did W-2 processing. Um, and this, this, company Grace offered services uh, to uh, customers of Dun & Bradstreet's to basically, you know, fix bugs and, and uh, et cetera um, in, in their software. And Dun & Bradstreet offered those services as well, but they actually didn't, you know, they, they let Grace, they didn't object to Grace um, offering those services for a long time. Um, but then Grace started offering this uh, additional service called um, Remain on Release, where they would essentially um, allow customers to who would purchase the software from Dun & Bradstreet to avoid an expensive upgrade to the software by providing their, their own alternative to the uh, W2 processing software that, um, that called out to functions within the Dun & Bradstreet software um, the previous version done in Bratton Street software that was that was uh, licensed by by um, their shared customers. Um, and so this software basically, is, so the court refers repeatedly to call and copy commands. Um, I don't, it's, it's really unclear from the decision exactly what they did, but it sort of um, suggests that basically these were these were commands that would that would um, run done in Bradstreet software access um, certain functions of it and and you know the uh, DNB software would return data to the grace software um, and uh, you know by doing this they essentially replaced um, some functionality in the DNB software that was you know that that um, had fallen behind in the previous version and allowed customers to avoid upgrading um, but you know one of their arguments was, you know, we're not we're not copying their software. All we're doing is, you know, uh, opening a, a licensed copy of the software that the customer has on their own computers, calling its functionality, returning some data, and processing it with our own software. So, so, so since we're not doing any copying, um, you know, it's not infringement. The court referred to this argument as sophistry, mere sophistry, um, and and held that it was infringing. Um, so again, this is very similar to uh, arguments that, that get made regularly and seriously in, in the context of open source that, well, if we're not, if we're not actually um, copying any portion of your software, we're merely you know, linking to it, opening it and using it, that um, you know, it's not, it's not uh, a derivative work. And you know, I think this case illustrates the courts have rejected that and, and, and may well in the open source context as well. And then going back to the SciStar case, um, I summarized this before, um, but again, SciStar had a strong argument that they really hadn't made any, you know, they hadn't copied any Apple software. Um, the, they, they would purchase copies of OS X, um, install it on a computer, then take out um, certain Apple programs or kernel modules and replace them with their own in order to get the software working on their hardware. Um, but uh, the court held um, without <laughs> without too much trouble um, that you know basically these these uh, this recombination of Apple software with their own software was a derivative work. And you know um, this is actually one of the areas kernel modules are one of the areas of of sort of, um, you know, the hottest dispute around derivative works. The Linux, the Linux kernel um, has an interface for loading uh, separate kernel modules to into memory, um, you know, at runtime in order to provide 
hardware drivers and and other things. Um, and and there are many companies out there, um, particularly companies that provide virtualization or um, or um, embedded hardware devices um, like routers, et cetera, that you know have proprietary kernel modules um, combined with the Linux kernel and you know, it, there's there's a lot of agreement actually among you know the lawyers who who uh, represent those companies that, that this does not create a uh, derivative work of the Linux kernel. Uh, but I you know I find it very difficult to um, separate that uh, um, that situation from this one um, because it's it's really almost identical except that you know neither of these programs is open source software. So. The point of going through that exercise is just there are there are a lot of there are a lot of arguments for um, you know for trying to get around the the terms of copyleft licenses in specific situations you know and a lot of companies have decided that they really really don't want to do the work of writing their own software when when a GPL or LGPL uh, application is available. And so they, you know, they use these um, they use these arguments to sort of avoid uh, or or to argue that you know they're they're um, not infringing and above board. Uh, and a lot of a lot of companies get away with it, um, you know, in the sense that there's just not a ton of enforcement of open source licenses going on out there um, at any given time. Um, Although you're less likely to get away with it if if you're using a package that's produced by you know a, a commercial software company that just happens to make some of their software open source versus um, versus uh, you know a, a sort of nonprofit volunteer development community. Um, but um, you know I think by far the safest route is if you're going to be using GPL LGPL software um, in your applications, then, you know, stick with the, the interpretation of the Free Software Foundation um, that if you are combining that software um, in any way, you know, through linking or by literal copying with, with your application that you've created derivative work. The exception there is um, everyone seems to agree that if you are merely uh, interfacing with uh, with copylifted software through operating system calls. Um, so in, in the world of Unix, this might include fork and exec or uh, pipes. Um, but basically, if you've got two separate applications running on the operating system and they're merely communicating with each other through sort of standard operating system functions um, that you haven't created a derivative work, you're merely you know, you're merely interoperating with the software. So everyone, including the Free Software Foundation, agrees that that does not cause the derivative work to be made. Uh, I see, uh, Junji, you have a question or a comment in the chat, but I can't read it because it is in Portuguese. Uh, <laughs> was that not for us? Okay. Um, <laughs> no problem. Uh, okay, so moving to uh, uh, the question of what is distribution of software. So um, the question of what is a derivative work of software is important because it tells you whether uh, whether the software that you've combined with uh, open source software needs to be licensed under an open source license. The question of distribution um, tells you basically whether you are required to provide source code either for your uh, derivative work or just for the open source components that you're using in the case of uh, a weaker copyleft license. So uh, across the board, with the exception of the Afero GPL, every copyleft open source license uh, only requires you to uh, provide source code or, you know, comply in other regards with the license if you're distributing the software to a third party. So you can, for example, uh, take a GPL application, um, uh, combine it with proprietary software within your own organization, 
uh, provide that software to your employees, uh, run that software on your servers and have customer interface with that software over a network. Um, and because you haven't distributed um, a copy of the software, whether in source or object code form, to a third party, you're not required to license your software under uh, the same license, and you're not required to provide source code. So um, again, this is these are interpretations that are that are consistent across uh, the open source landscape. Um, so, is there a, um, a question? Yeah, please. Yeah, quick question. Uh, interesting one. And um, when you've got large conglomerates where they're actually an umbrella of various global companies, um, I actually work for JP Morgan, and I think we're 21 different country companies worldwide. Is that seen as distribution throughout that company? Uh, that is a good question, and one I will get to a little bit later. Unfortunately, the answer is a little bit unclear. Um, but um, but I do ha I do have some slides on specifically that question. Yeah, and the, and the follow-up would be, of course, spin-offs and breakups, where you get regulators spinning off part of the firm. Because I'm guessing yeah. that would be definitely distribution. <laughs> Most likely, but um, we'll let's get into that in a in a little bit. Um, it's it's probably my next slide. Um, so uh, so where all where this question of distribution comes from is again the Copyright Act. So under the Copyright Act, uh, the owner of a copyright has an exclusive right to distribute copies of their copyrighted works. Um, but distribution itself is not defined. Um, and as I said, the terms of copyleft licenses with the exclusion of the AGPL uh, only apply um, if you're distributing the software, whether it's a source or object code. So distri distribution becomes an issue um, if you're hiring third-party contractors to modify GPL software, or as Simon pointed out, um, shipping GPL software um, between organizations within the, the same corporate umbrella structure, uh, or um, if you're determining, you know, when copyleft should be, you know, incorporated into a SaaS product. Uh, so there is a there is a thorough analysis of all of these questions in this article that I've linked to here by Heather Meeker. Heather Meeker is an open source lawyer who's been working uh, in the field for a long time. She works for a firm called O'Melveny Myers. Um, she's written a book called Open Source for Business where um, you know, a variant of this article is, is reproduced as well. Um, but if you want to, if you want a really thorough analysis of what distribution means um, under the law, then it's, that's a great place for you to start. Uh, unfortunately, um, unfortunately, she does not have many more answers for you than I will, but she does have some suggestions for strategies for sort of shoring up an argument that um, a particular distribution or a particular arrangement with a company is, um, or, or an affiliate, et cetera, is not distribution. Um, so, uh, what is distribution of software? Uh, again, this is something that um, is not defined by open source licenses um, in particular, although some might have specific terms that that touch on this um, or, or, or that give a little bit of additional color under those particular licenses. Um, but generally, you have to turn to copyright law to determine what distribution is. Um, and again, though, Copyright law reserves uh, the exclusive right of distribution to the copyright owner. It does not say what distribution is. Um, so things that are definitely distribution. If you provide a copy of open source software, whether in executable or source code form, to a customer, to a partner that is not part of your company, um, or any other third party, um, in you know, in a way that's sort of like uh, you're selling a product or uh, et cetera, as a sort of public distribution, um, then you have, you've definitely distributed the software. Um, you can be pretty sure that if you have a, an on-premises offering that you deliver to a customer and, and they install or you install on their premises, on their servers, et cetera, 
and it incorporates uh, copyleft software, you you can bet that's a distribution as well. And then a, a third one that that is um, you know a little less obvious but an important consideration is uh, if you're using open source uh, copyleft open source software um, in your client side JavaScript uh, for you know a website or for a web based product, um, then that uh, that JavaScript is going to be downloaded by the user's browser um, and run there. Uh, and so I, it's a pretty safe bet as well that that would be a distribution of the software. Um, now, generally speaking, um, you know, I think this is typically only going to be a distribution of, uh, of the open source so or the, you know, the client side JavaScript software. It is not going to affect um, the license of software running on the on the server and the back end. Um, now, I, I suppose that it's possible that that there may be some configurations of software or, or some combinations of server and client side software where that would not be the case and they're all one work. Um, but um, you know that would that would be getting down into the details that you know we don't have here. Uh, things that are definitely not distribution providing copies of open source software to different employees within the same company. Now, here we're talking about actual employees, not necessarily uh, independent contractors who look for all the world like employees, which is a question we'll get into in a second. Um, and then using an open source library or open source application on the server side of a company hosted uh, software as a service offering, again, generally speaking, if you have not distributed a copy of the um, of either the copyleft software or a derivative work of the copyleft software, then you have not triggered the copyleft obligation under the applicable open source license. What is probably distribution? Um, providing copies of open source software to affiliates that are not owned or not in common ownership with your company or minority owned subsidiaries. Um, of you know of a company, so you know if if the company is controlled majority by someone else, then uh, the argument gets a lot stronger that um, you've made a distribution. Um, and uh, acquisition of modified open source software or just open source software um, as as part of a merger of two companies, where a company is you know one company is sold to another. Um, generally speaking. Um, I would expect that that would be um, a distribution. Uh, so Heather Meeker concludes in that article, and I agree that providing copies of open source software to wholly or majority owned subsidiaries or um, I guess companies under common ownership um, with you know, a company that majority owns both of them, uh, I would not expect that to be considered a distribution, um, but but would be you know equivalent, I would think, to providing uh, software between employees of the same company. Um, now, whether your specific corporate structure uh, looks more like this or um, includes, as as might be the case, particularly with the foreign um, foreign subsidiaries. Uh, might involve some minority-owned companies. Um, that's uh, that is a question uh, for you for you to to worry about with your counsel. Um, now, it's worth saying that you know there's not necessarily a massive risk involved if you have you know if you're distributing software to uh, you know a, an affiliate. Um, and they, and it turns out to be a distribution under a copyleft license um, because you know all that that means is that that affiliate has the legal right under the license to uh, distribute that software under the terms of the license. Now, practically speaking, uh, are they going to do that? Um, you know, my guess is in most circumstances, the the interests of your two companies would be aligned in that 
you know, nobody would benefit from them distributing that software unless there is unless there is some kind of dispute and they decide to get you know to get ugly. Um, it's merely a license uh, to do that. But um, so I think I think that the actual risk in many circumstances we might you know be concerned about here is is mitigated by by those practical considerations. But um, uh, it is it is likely it would be a distribution if you're talking about a company that is not under common majority ownership. Uh, so what about independent contractors? Um, so distribution to an independent contractor, whether they're an individual uh, or a company, whether it's on or off site, um, I think you have to assume is distribution. Now, I realize the question of individual independent contractors you know, working on site is a is a particular concern for a lot of our members. Um, it's, so, but you know, there's no, there's nothing that I'm aware of in the copyright law or in or in cases um, that suggests that m an independent contractor who is working, you know, 40 hours a week at your company is anything other than a third party uh, for the purposes of distribution. Um, but there are a couple of factors that suggest that um, that actually this this may not be distribution, um, at least in the context of the GPL. Uh, so the Free Software Foundation um, has an entry, an FAQ entry on their website um, that uh, that suggests that they're only concerned with offsite distribution. Now I'm going to go ahead and bring up that entry. So um, in their FAQ. Uh, the FSF says, is making and using multiple copies within one organization or company distribution. No, in that case, the organization is just making copies for itself. As a consequence, a company or other organization can develop a modified version and install that version through its own facilities without giving the staff permission to release that modified version to outsiders. However, when the organization transfers copies to other organizations or individuals, that is distribution, in particular, providing copies to contractors for use off-site is distribution. So th this is just the FSF's view. The FSF wrote the GPL, but ultimately, you know, that what they think is not necessarily um, going to matter if you're dealing with somebody else's GPL license software. They they only wrote the license, but what what the license itself says is what a what a judge would be looking at if this was ever to come to to litigation. So um, it's uh, so um, you know the the FSF seems to consider whether you are uh, using the software on or off site to be relevant. Um, so they that would seem to suggest they don't think that um, providing copies of GPL software to a contractor who's working within the four walls of your company to be distribution, but that is only their opinion. Um, now, there's also an argument presented in Heather Meeker's paper that um, distribution does not include uh, private, a uh, distribution under the Copyright Act does not include private limited distribution. Um, so basically, in other words, um, so, what distribution, well, and I'll, let me just go ahead and bring up the Copyright Act again, because um, because it's relevant. Let's see if I've got the right, no, there we go. Okay, so if you look at the third, so these are the these are the exclusive rights of a copyright holder under the United States Copyright Act. Um, and what item three here says is it's the exclusive right of the copyright owner to distribute copies of the copyrighted work to the public by sale or other transfer of ownership by rental, lease, or lending. So um, if if you focus on that to the public element. Um, then there's an argument that providing copies of, you know, a, a copyrighted work that you have a license to, 
to a third party in a private limited way is not a uh, distribution within the meaning of the Copyright Act. So um, that is that is you know an argument that your legal counsel can consider in making a determination about what the risk is in providing you know, open source software or modified open source software to a particular third party contractor, whether inside or outside your company. Um, uh, but the the answer is not is not 100 percent clear from the law. Um, so, again, this the, the concerns around distribution are somewhat mitigated by the fact that, you know, distribution merely means that the license requires um, that you give the recipient of the software a license and a copy of the source code. Uh, it does not mean that the source code must be published. So it's a common misunderstanding that the GPL in particular um, says that if you, you know, if you're if you're distributing open source software or GPL software, then you're required to um, make your version of it uh, publicly available. And that's not the case. You're only required to provide the source code to uh, recipients of the software from you. Um, uh, in the context of GPL, um, you know, the recipient having a license to redistribute the software, um, you, you're not allowed to constrain that, um, but it doesn't preclude professional consequences. So, you know, if a contractor goes and distributes GPL software that you don't want it to, um, you can still fire them. <laughs> Um, uh, and it's worth pointing out, and this is a, a really significant point, so I want to emphasize it. GPL version 3 um, does away with this uncertainty. Uh, it specifically provides that you can distribute uh, GPL software um, to a third-party contractor, whether inside or outside your organization, to either make modifications exclusively for you or to run the software exclusively for you. So for example, um, if you have a, a third party hosting provider um, and, you're, and you're running hosted SaaS software that includes GPL software, um, as long as you, you know, have contractual terms that require that you know, they provide this software, the modifications only for your company, then um, you're not required to permit them to distribute the software further. Um, so uh, this is a problem that is essentially not a problem under GPL version 3. Now, for better or worse, GPL version 3 is not as popular yet as GPL version 2. Um, there was a fair amount of controversy when GPL v3 was first released um, around certain provisions that I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and, and so its uptake was somewhat limited in the beginning. Um, Significantly, the Linux kernel project um, decided not to adopt uh, GPL version three, and so um, you know, so this isn't going to apply there. Um, but there is a lot of software, a lot of GPL version two software out in the world that is um, that is licensed uh, under GPL version two or later, or GPL version two plus, which is. Um, there's a sort of standard way set out in the in GPL version two for signifying that um, recipients of software that you wrote and licensed under GPL v2 are permitted to use the software under um, a later version of the license uh, published by the Free Software Foundation. And so um, if you are using software that is licensed with that uh, particular marker, GPL version two or later, then you have permission from the copyright owners to use that software under the terms of GPL version three. And therefore you have the right to get around this uncertainty around uh, what is distribution when it comes to third party contractors. So this is something that is, you know, should be part of your analysis when, you know, determining whether to use GPL version two software in, in the context where you're going to have to make it available to third party contractors, because if you can upgrade the license to version three, then you're in the clear. Uh, any questions about distribution?
All right, moving on to compatibility. Um, so uh, license compatibility, meaning uh, compatibility between different open source licenses is basically only an issue uh, when copyleft licenses are involved. And that's because uh, unlike permissive licenses, copyleft licenses uh, require that derivative works be um, made available under the same terms. So permissive licenses generally, as long as you are complying with the terms of the permissive license, it doesn't matter how you license, you know, the combination of that permissive license code with your own software. But um, copyleft licenses have an opinion about that. Um, and so an incompatibility happens when, um, when you have, you know, a copy, copyleft software, A, and software under any other license that purports to restrict um, what is done with the combination um, in a way that is incompatible with the, the copyleft software. Um, so the GPL in particular says um, you, you cannot uh, impose any additional restrictions on licensees um, of the GPL software or uh, a derivative work of the GPL software. So if you're trying to use GPL software with software under a license that contains a restriction that does not appear in the GPL, then you have an incompatibility and, um, and the result would infringe both licenses, arguably, because you've combined them um, with licenses they're incompatible with. So the most common example of this, or the most, the example that's probably of most concern is uh, GPL version two is not compatible or not considered to be compatible with Apache version two. Um, because Apache version two contains a, um, a defensive termination uh, provision relating to its patent license that is uh, more restrictive than any term in GPLv2. So, um, you know, these, these incompatibilities are something to keep an eye out for. Um, another common example is uh, GPL is not compatible with, um, with the uh, CDDL the Sun Common Distribution and something license, um, because basically they're both copyleft licenses that, that have different requirements. And so it's impossible to combine them in the same work and comply with both licenses. Uh, GPL incompatibility or GPL version two incompatibilities, um, it's uh, incompatible with, um, Mozilla public license version 1.1 um, with the Eclipse public license versions one and two and with the CDDL because they just have incompatible copyleft terms. Um, the LGPL and GPL version three is incompatible with GPL version two, uh, again, because of incompatible copyleft terms, um, unless the GPL software, the GPL version two software includes an or later designation like we discussed earlier. Apache 2, Quick as I mentioned. Yeah, please. Yeah, yep. Um, and I don't think it's compatibility, but if you've got a copyleft license um, within the transfer dependencies and the author has chosen to put a permissive license on it, that I'm guessing that's not so much permissive as a conflict. Or is that, is, is that a incompatibility in your mind? Sorry, uh, say again. So, 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 so if, if an author has included code within their code mm -hmm. which is copyleft and then and then they choose to put a permissive license right. on the parent product um then I'm, I'm presuming that obviously the copyleft within that conspires into the full product so that's right they can't they shouldn't they, they shouldn't be doing a permissive license it actually becomes by default a, a copyleft that's right so um if you if you have a, a dependency that is copyleft then you know that license requires that you um, make the entire combination available under um, under terms that are compatible with it. Now, it's it gets a little bit tricky, right? Because um, w the GPL doesn't. Well, the GPL does say you know the the combination must be available under the terms of this license. Now, you can combine. Um, you can combine permissive licensed code with GPL licensed code and 
you know, and so long as um, the recipient has, you know, the right to use the GPL code under the GPL, and you're not attempting to sort of relicense that, then, um, then really, it's not, it's not really a situation where the GPL, uh, you, you know, where the Apache code is is relicensed under the GPL. You know, they still exist under their own licenses. It's just that it, it's in, it's incorrect to conclude that the license for the entire package is Apache because you are essentially you're essentially representing to recipients okay. yeah, that sense. the GPL software is yeah. Um, okay, and then uh, the Open SSL license is also considered to be incompatible with the GPL version two because of a weird. It's it's a very unusual license, and it's got it's got a weird anti copyleft term in it. Um, that said, OpenSSL was relicensed under Apache recently, and so um, this is not uh, well. It's still <laughs> incompatible with GPL version two, but it's not incompatible with GPL version three. Um, so, what changed uh, from GPL version two to GPL version three? Um, Oh, you know, sorry, we're we are out of time. So I I want to give people the opportunity to sign off if they if they need to. I apologize for not watching as carefully as I needed to. Um, uh, if if you all would like me to continue with this, I'm more than happy to. I think I've got one. I, I need to drop off, but it's been been really useful. Okay. Thanks very much. Okay, fantastic. Thanks for joining, Sam. Um, all right, so the differences between GPL version three and GPL version two. GPL version three added some new restrictions. Um, so you're not permitted to forbid a circumvention of uh, digital rights management um, that controls um, that controls your work to the extent that it prevents uh, recipients from exercising their rights under the license. Um, so you know practically what this means is, you can't lock down your product in a way that prevents um, a recipient of the product from um, from modifying and um, and reinstalling modified versions of GPL software. Um, so this becomes uh, this is a particular concern in um, in embedded devices um, where you know the the producers of the devices um, often like to basically encrypt the um, encrypt the uh, firmware to prevent any modifications to it. Um, but GPL, if you've got GPL v3 software in there, um, the license says that the user needs to be able to, uh, needs to be permitted to circumvent DRM and reinstall modified versions of the, of the GPL software. Uh, relatedly, GPL version three requires that um, producers of user products that contain GPL software, and a user product is basically a consumer electronics product, um, they're required to provide installation information for GPL software. In other words, they have to provide information sufficient to allow a recipient of the product to um, install modified versions of the GPL software. Um, so this was included by the Free Software Foundation um, in, in response to an increasing trend where device manufacturers who were building Linux-based devices were making it impossible for users to install um, their own versions of software on the devices. Um, and I've got a typo here, but you're not permitted to uh, limit the license of a target in a corporate acquisition. Um, and, and you must provide them with source code. So if you if you um, uh, if you um, if, if a company is transferred um, in in a corporate acquisition or a merger um, and has licenses under open source under under GPL version three, um, then the recipient or the purchaser of the company. Um, receives those licenses and has a right to receive source code to um, the license software. <clears throat> uh, and then there are there are new terms in the GPL that are that are generally beneficial to corporate um, users, um, e even though those three were, you know, raised a lot of concerns among among, um, you know, corporate users of open source when when GPL v3 was first released. 
Um, as I said, it contains a specific um, exemption for providing uh, copies privately to contractors to make modifications or to run the software for you. Um, it allows you to, so under GPL version two, there was arguably no, um, there was no way to comply with your source provision obligations by um, providing source code on the internet um, because GPL version two was written before the internet was really common. And so you had to provide a copy um, or offer to provide a copy to users. Um, but GPL has, has or GPL version three has changed that and allows you to offer source code from the same location that you provide the uh, object code. Uh, GPL version three allows you to include certain additional terms that, that would arguably restrict be restrictions under the license um, that would be incompatible. Um, but uh, so these are, these are things like, you know, reasonable um, IP notices or limitations of liability, et cetera. So you're allowed to add certain supplemental terms that are compatible with section seven. And, um, and then finally, um, GPL version three, so both GPL version two and GPL version three um, will terminate automatically if you violate the license. GPL version three provides um, for automatic reinstatement of your license um, if you come back into compliance within, um, within a certain period of time. So that you know makes it easier to deal with uh, to deal with violations uh, once you've discovered them. Um, so just a few notes on GPL version three compatibility. Again, look for GPL version two or later, or GPL version two plus in the in the license um, of of GPL version two software that you're using because you may well get a benefit from using the software under GPL version three uh, instead of GPL version two. Um, GPL version three um, again permits certain limited restrictions. It's compatible with Apache version two, whereas GPL version two wasn't, um, and it provides one-way compatibility with the Afero GPL, um, meaning that even though they're, they would otherwise be incompatible, the GPL version three specifically lets you combine GPL version three software with a Afero GPL which has to be licensed under the Afero license. So that is the deep dive on copyleft. Um, I hope that it has been um, informative, if not entertaining. Um, and uh, if you all have any questions, you're welcome to ask them now or, or, um, or to email me, um, Aaron at finnis.org.